Welcome to Managing Uncertainty, a podcast series from the experts at Bright Path discussing global risk, business continuity, and crisis management. Will you be ready to lead your organization through its critical moment? Welcome back to the Managing Uncertainty podcast. This is Brian Strauser, Principal and CEO at Bright Path. And I want to talk a little bit about some changes that we're going to make to the podcast starting with this episode. We have decided now to release two episodes each week, and they're going to have a little different focus. The first episode each week, the one that you're listening to right now, is going to be more of a news and current events focused discussion. We're going to look at somewhere between three and five things that are happening in the news uh, or are planned to happen in the coming days that are relevant to your preparedness uh, capabilities around the world. And so joining me for this discussion will be the rest of the Bright Path consulting team, Jennifer Otremba and Bray Wheeler. And I'm going to have uh, Jen and Bray introduce themselves, and then we'll come back to me and talk a little bit about what this is going to look like. Jen? Hi, I'm Jen Otremba. I'm a senior consultant here at Bright Path. Hi, this is Bray Wheeler. I'm a consultant here at Bright Path. Why don't each of you talk just a little bit about your backgrounds for a, a little bit? Sure. So I started at Bright Path a few years ago now, but I took a little bit of a leave of absence. I'm in the also in the National Guard. I've got over 20 years experience with the military, and I've been gone for about uh, almost a year, right, guys? Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Over in the Middle East, working. Uh, I like how you said you kind of took a sabbatical, but it's not like this was by choice. (laughs) Yeah. No. (laughs) No. A little bit of a break (laughs) from Bright Path for my my other career path there. So before that, I was, um, I know that I've introduced myself before on the podcast, but as a reminder, I worked with Brian for quite a long time and Bray as well uh, when we were all at Target together. Mr. Wheeler? Yeah, I've been with Bright Path just just about a year now. Mm -hmm. So before that, um, I worked, uh, like Jen mentioned, with Brian and and Jen at Target um, doing a lot of different stuff. So I'm brand new to the podcast. My background is everything from crisis management um, in an operations center, to enterprise crisis management, to intelligence, to corporate security. So just about, I touched just about everything. This is actually Bray's, this is Bray's first episode on yeah. the podcast, despite yeah. almost a year of trying to get him to do a podcast. <laughs> so, so I show up and Bray's all in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, we got to take, uh, got to lighten the load a little bit. I got to <laughs> deflect it just a little bit, take the pressure off. Yeah. So th- this uh, this change in our format uh, came from a discussion that the three of us were having at the tail end of uh, last week, but we've kind of been thinking about this for a while. I think there's a place in the market to have discussion about more current events uh, as they happen uh, without going into kind of the deep dive process discussion, which is what our typical episode has been. So we hope you find this valuable. I think um, we think this is going to be an interesting conversation. Yeah. No, I think... It- It brings a little bit something different than just kind of, to your point, deep diving into something. It's a little bit more of, hey, what just happened in the last week and what do we kind of expect? A little bit of interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? And plus, let's face it, we're all all sitting around talking about what's going on in the world every day anyway. So we might as well talk about it with everyone. That's right. Right. And I think we may bring some things to the forefront that maybe you're not thinking about. But as, and I know this is going to happen with one of the topics we're going to discuss today. Maybe it's something you should be thinking about because it will have future impact on what we do. So let's move on to the, uh, let's move right into the topics we have for today. The first one, uh, which I'll kind of tee up the discussion is, um, from a Wall Street Journal article, the tail end of last week. And this is the announcement from the U.S. Department of Justice that Walmart has agreed to plead guilty and pay $282 million in a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act case involving facilitation payments that Walmart made in Brazil, China, India, and Mexico. This is at the tail end of a six-year discussion and investigation that's gone on between Walmart and the United States government to get to this settlement. It requires Walmart to pay $144 million in ill-begotten gains to the Securities and Exchange Commission and a $138 million FCA, FCPA penalty to the U.S. Justice Department. It's one of the largest cases, if not the largest cases ever. This investigation started, according to this article, in 2012, which had uh, an investigation from the New York Times about payments that Walmart had made in Mexico in order to obtain permits to build stores there. And then it expanded to Brazil, China, and India. 
reactions? I mean, I'm shaking my head. I just, from a business perspective, this is a huge deal, right? A crisis management. I can't imagine what they're doing in their op center as this is starting to hit the news. You mm-hmm. know? There's certainly a reputational issue here that's, I mean, Walmart already has had over the years some challenges reputationally with its compliance with various aspects of law, but you know, not not necessarily recognized as a place where workers are treated fairly, and you know, a lot of various exploitation of communities and stuff that have been alleged along the way. And then here comes this massive bribery case. Well, I think for Walmart too, the amount of money probably isn't the issue for them. It's the having the largest fine ever mm-hmm. and the reputational fallout of it mm-hmm. is. I mean, that's for companies. That's that hurts more, more so than the fines, especially for a company the size of Walmart. And what do you guys think as far as Walmart goes? Do you think it's going to have a huge reputational impact? I mean, do you think that Walmart shoppers care about no, this? I don't. Because I, I don't know that I do either. I think other companies, this would be a bigger hit, but I don't know that Walmart would be as affected. Well, I think we were discussing this on Friday with one of our clients uh, just on our regular status call that this had just news had just come out. And I think that, and this is a company that operates internationally, particularly in Asia, and they're in India. And I think this, you know, I think it immediately kind of raised his heckle from the standpoint of, well, I wonder what we're going to do about this. Because obviously there was heightened intensity that led to kind of this issue. I mean, it's kind of interesting that if you get into the article, uh, Walmart has spent $900 million investigating this over the last seven years internally. That doesn't count the the fine and the SEC payment. But at the core of the issue uh, in terms of what they've paid out or, or what was alleged rather by the SEC and the uh, DOJ is that Walmart grew significantly in the 1990s and they didn't ramp up their systems to account for corruption risk. So system, there's kind of a systematic accusation here that they weren't prepared to deal with the possibility that this might happen. Well, it's one of those ignorance is not an excuse Yeah. at that point where you can't just, you're so heavily focused on expanding the business that you're not accounting for those people you're hiring on the other end, the partners you have on the other end, Mm -hmm. just awareness to that process that it's not, it's not the same old, same old environment you're used to. And I guess I would argue what other large corporations are also not prepared for this type of thing. That have had huge growth in a short period of time, just like Walmart. A lot, probably. A lot, I right? I would think. Walmart's just the one that's hit the news and that's, is getting caught right now. Right. And do you think that this is going to have a long effect on other corporations as this has come out? I mean, I think the wake-up call here is probably around as global expansion ramps up, your compliance capability needs to ramp up with it. I mean, we've worked with we have other clients that have had some FCPA challenges related to bribery in foreign countries where the same thing happened. They grew rapidly. They spun up global operations, um, but they didn't spin up a compliance capability to make sure that folks were educated and that they were looking for these issues. Right. I mean, that's, that's really what the sec is accusing Walmart of is they didn't ramp up their capabilities as they grew so much internationally. And we've been through this. Right. Both as employees and as you know, as a consulting firm. So, I did find the Brazilian uh, accusations kind of interesting because my um, when I was in business school, our international residency was in Brazil. Uh, one of the presentations that uh, we were divided into groups after the two week trip to Brazil, and each of us had to talk. Each of our groups had to get up and talk about a specific aspect of what we learned in Brazil. My team got tax was really not that interesting but another team <laughs> had business ethics and compliance and the subject of their presentation was when they got up they put up a slide in brazilian colors and it said corruption and business ethics in brazil this shit is corrupt and that was the presentation <laughs> mind you it was our last presentation before graduation so we may have been a little punchy <laughs> we we all heard this in, in different aspects of our own careers that go to India, go to Brazil, go to Mexico, and facilitation payments, a.k.a. bribery, are the norm. Yeah. Yeah. And they're they part of business. Yeah. Yeah, it's part, of the, it's part of the culture. That's what they're used to. And so if you go into those places relying on kind of the experts on the ground, mm-hmm. they're going to go with what they know, and that's, right. that's how they do business. Right. right. We had a criminal case in, uh, 
in India once that we were dealing with in, in our prior life where we attempted to get, you know, some prosecution on a case and the local police commander was like, I also would really like a bike like that one, but we're filing a prosecution. Yeah, but I would like a bike like that bike, that motorbike, motorcycle. So needless to say, the person didn't get prosecuted. <laughs> we didn't buy him a motorcycle. <laughs> or I'm sorry, Jen, what's our next topic? Okay, so everyone's favorite discussion, the Middle East and Iran is basically the update. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to continue kind of keeping an eye on what's happening in the Middle East and specifically what's happening with Iran because some of the latest things that have come out are, um, obviously we saw that a drone was shot down. Mm -hmm. Everyone's seen that on news now. We've seen how the United States has responded to that or not responded, depending on what your opinion is on what should be done or what shouldn't be done. Or who you want to um, believe. Yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've seen some discussions around cyber attacks. I've seen new sanctions that are going to be put in place for Iran. And then the reaction for what Iran's going to think about that or what, what their reaction is going to be towards the United States and through not just the United States, but other coalition forces around the world. Mm -hmm. So two things have happened, right? There was a tanker attack. Now, two weeks ago, yeah. multiple There's, tankers. Yeah, two tankers. There's some dispute about exactly what happened and who's behind it. But the attack was limpet mines, which are magnetic mines that are usually placed by a diver. It's the Navy SEAL's preferred way to sabotage a ship. But a, the, one of the ship's crew on one of the tankers said they saw a torpedo, so maybe it wasn't a limpet mine. There's dispute, debate. I don't know, I disinformation. Even, even reports that crew members were reporting a shell. Somebody actually fired over the waterline. Like artillery, like, not artillery, artillery but like a ship, yeah. ship to ship. Yeah. Fascinating. Yep. Yeah, it is. Lots of accounts. Yeah. And we've, our Rivers. state, the U.S. Mm -hmm. State Department has said it was Iran that was behind it, but other countries are disputing this. Of course. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so we have that. That's two weeks ago. That ramps up some tension. And then last week, what happens? They get the drone shot down. Yep. And Iran claims it was over their territorial water. We said it was in international air. I'm, I'm sorry, it was in international airspace. They claim it was in their airspace. That's common, though, right? The argument of where it was exactly when it was shot down. Was it legal to shoot it down or was it an act of war, really? Right. Well, that's not an uncommon conversation, to your point. I mean, they, <laughs> no. Russia and the U.S. do that all the time. All on the time. Whether or not we're in each other's airspace or not. Right. So. Yeah, right. exactly. So, and then there was, uh, apparently we were going to attack Iran and retaliate by hitting some missile capabilities, or I guess it's not really clear what we were allegedly going after. Right. And then if you follow the common narrative, we, the president canceled the attack 10 minutes before it was supposed to go off. Uh, but he disputes that the New York times and Washington post have a TikTok story from the weekend about kind of the play by play of what happened. But again, it's tough to know who to believe when there's multiple versions of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sure, there's, I'm sure there's some truth somewhere in between, but we're not going to have all of the information. Right. Um, and we're not going to have all the information that the executive branch has in front of them either as we're kind of making our opinions on the topic. But I think that this, is, this will be interesting to continue to watch mm -hmm. and to see how this is going to affect really all of us in the United States. But... For me, it hits really close to home, understanding I still have friends right now working and operating in the Middle East, so I have a lot of concerns with mm -hmm. how this is all going to play out. So the FAA has banned overflight of Iran for international flights involving American-flagged aircraft. Um, it won't stop the Europeans and others from doing so, but it will apply to U.S. carriers anyway. Um, certainly American companies don't really operate in Iran because of decades old sanctions, but we're everywhere else. I mean, yeah. we're, I mean, Dubai is one of the world's big financial centers. It's right across the Strait of Hormuz from where all of this was going on. And that's a common travel hub for folks going to Asia or elsewhere in the Middle East, to be fair. I mean, Emirates has pretty significant service from the U.S. to there and then on to other locales like India. There's a lot of risk in disrupting the market. I think there's less less issue with oil disruption because of the growth in U.S. oil production over the last decade in North Dakota and elsewhere. But there's still a lot of risk to the global economy that comes into play here. 
Well, and it's obviously a very volatile situation. So mm-hmm. we're having this conversation of what airspace is what. And we shot your passenger airplane down because it was in our airspace. Right. Was it? What well, You know, I mean, that's pretty scary. Well, I think to the oil price discussion, too, a lot of times historically, if we would have, this would have been 10 years ago, oh, oil, oil prices, global oil prices have shot up. Nobody's really seeing that at the pump in the U.S. Yeah, right now right. because yeah. we've kind of buffered ourselves a little bit. Right. But I think from just the global economy piece and then somebody did a breakdown, one of the talking heads on one of the cable networks kind of broke down um, kind of the impacts of if it went to full-scale escalation and how pretty much the U.S. and its allies pretty much could beat Iran pretty easily based on just U.S.'s power. But they did an, kind of an interesting take on kind of playing out how if Iran was to really succeed in this, they would rely on their proxies. And that those proxies then carry into Saudi Arabia. They carry into UAE. They carry into Afghanistan, Lebanon. Iraq, Lebanon, Lebanon into Israel, the Strait, you know, mm-hmm. Hormuz. Like they, they're pretty much going to disrupt that entire region just using their proxy network mm-hmm. at pretty much on one order. And, and that's been their game plan for the last four decades uh, since the revolution has been to engage in a proxy campaign uh, against the United States and Western allies through the ways that you just described. Direct military action has rarely been their forte, or, or has been, I shouldn't say forte, has been their approach against the United States. Yeah, because I think it's... For a reason. Well, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it's the only way. Why fight the Leviathan head on if you can use proxies to do that? Yeah, absolutely. But I think it's interesting from just the, from kind of that business mindset... It's not just U.S. Iran or Iran Iraq kind of tensions and all oh, this won't have anything or maybe it's just oil or the commodities coming through the strait. It's if you're doing business anywhere in the Middle East for any reason, you're you're at risk and should be thinking about that that proxy fight and mm-hmm. that that ability for those governments and those institutions to hold up against some of that without cracking down or having to pick a side or a lot of other right and not just economy for the United States, but really this is a a world economy issue. Mm-hmm. So definitely an area that businesses should be monitoring mm-hmm. and looking, I think, uh, for multiple sources of truth about what's going on because there's there's certainly a dispute here about what has happened. And, and, of course, both countries will have their own version of what's going on. So I think look for multiple sources of truth from the news and, and get a holistic perspective of what's going on. Right. Bray, you want to take us to our last uh, current event of the, yeah. of the episode? So so this is a little bit of one to watch because it's a little bit kind of new breaking story, um, but it's out of Turkey. So over the last four or five months, for sure, uh, there's been some discrepancy in the uh, mayor's race in Istanbul. Erdogan's kind of President Erdogan uh, of Turkey, his kind of chosen candidate, lost in the election in March. Um, and so he called for a recount which was highly controversial. Mm -hmm. And then they just did the recount or they just did a a revote and his candidate lost even worse. So now he's having to deal with the fallout of kind of the economic pressure that he's facing in his country, but then also his political pressure that's now amping up because Istanbul is his home turf. Um, His party's controlled it for pretty much like the last 25 years or something. Um, And so now he's having to face kind of this increased pressure um, against his administration and against his kind of administrative policies. The Wall Street Journal has a pretty good dive into this from a few days ago. Well, I guess from yesterday, now that I look at the article. And there's question about, I mean, historically, the president of Turkey has gotten what he wants, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there's been, he might get challenged, but usually the various government agencies line up behind what he wants, even though these elections are supposed to be independent and, and not are being you know not impacting on a national level. Will he accept the mayoral results? And if he does, what political powers and authorities will he allow the mayor of Istanbul to keep compared to stripping them? One, well, particularly him getting what he wants. He, I mean, that's kind of his, has been his mo is he's gotten what he wants. Mm-hmm. Um, to your point, for 25 years. For over 25 years. Yeah. He's gotten what he wanted. And now it's now he's facing some real serious challenges to his ability to 
control that power. And it should point out, I mean, his margin of victory in this second race here was 54 to 45. It wasn't close. No. At all. No. That's out, way outside the margin of error. Right. Yeah. Even for... Even for what happened <laughs> there. Not non-U.S. countries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who probably don't poll as much as we do. <laughs> but I think from kind of that impact and kind of why we're kind of highlighting that and something to watch is Turkey's kind of a, a pretty good bellwether um, in terms of just stability and kind of the kind of the source of truth on the ground for how everything's feeling both from that connection to Europe and the Middle East. And so if there's some grumbling there that typically kind of there's some fallout politically anyway, um, kind of across that region and makes everybody a little bit, a little bit more uncertain um, as that kind of goes along. And Turkey's also, you know, kind of a player for a lot of different U S based companies, global companies, um, just its proximity and its geography and its capabilities as a country. Um, it's definitely something to watch and keep keep aware of um, as this kind of plays out because this they're not afraid to protest either there and so it's not they're not afraid to have this amp up a little bit. Should point out that the the current president has been president for twenty five years and will be president until at least twenty twenty three. He got into this office having previously been the mayor of Istanbul. That was yes. his launching pad to the presidency and a national scale race. Yet now he's saying that the mayor is just like a piece of shop window decoration. <laughs> that was his statement yesterday. Well, I mean, of course he is. Yeah. He's minimizing right. yeah. the role of the mayor of this. Absolutely. Yeah. He did congratulate him on Twitter though. Well, that's generous. <laughs> <laughs> well, he may under, undercut him. Yeah. From a business standpoint, lots of American businesses, lots of global businesses operate in Istanbul. I mean, our previous employer did. We dealt with a number of issues in Istanbul uh, that went on uh, over the years, mo- uh, mostly related to protests and disruption. Mm-hmm. Never really, can't think of any incidents involving violence or. No, there was some terrorism stuff as mm-hmm. some years back, kind of as Syria was really ramping up and mm-hmm. kind of some of those connections, but. Well, we certainly have extensive experience dealing with world protests and what happens to right. corporations in those events. So Turkey, we view that this is one we need to watch. This is the long-term piece here to watch because at some point there's going to be some kind of transition, right? I mean, yeah. the current president isn't going to live or serve for forever. No. No. And definitely his he's facing some pretty tough challenges with his economy and things like that mm-hmm. too that he's – this is the most pressure, kind of non-violence, non-full-out protest pressure that he's felt that really throughout the country people mm-hmm. are feeling a little bit uncertain as to the direction he's taking them in. And so he's he's going to have to make some choices. Headwinds are significant. Yes. Yes, they are. Yeah. Well, that's it for this newsy edition of the Managing Uncertainty podcast. Catch our other episode in a few days where we'll talk be talking more in-depth about protest movement in Hong Kong and what that means for global and U.S. businesses that are operating in Hong Kong and what those long-term impacts might be. Look forward to having you on the next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of Managing Uncertainty, produced by the experts at BrightPath. To receive notifications of new episodes, join our newsletter at brightpath.com or subscribe to your favorite podcast player, such as iTunes or Google Play. Learn more about the services and trusted advice from BrightPath by visiting brightpath.com. That's B-R-Y-G-H-T-P-A-T-H dot com.